Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, in his coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the first lesson.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste through a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her room, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child of my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and in his descendants forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Suspended at the apogee 
of the golden dawn. She curls in a brown pod, and inside her the mind of Christ, cloaked in blood, watches and begins to grow. The angel Gabriel leaves, and Mary runs with haste. A newly pregnant teenager makes for the hills, not slowing down, until she reaches the home of her cousin, Elizabeth, also pregnant. When Elizabeth welcomes her, she bursts into song. I love this gospel story. I cherish it because it is one of the few narratives in the Bible that is female-centered. <laughs> Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, is there, but he is literally silenced throughout. We should all resonate with the story deeply because its setting is domestic, intimate, and earthy. But most of all, it allows us to view Mary, the mother of Jesus, as a whole human being. To view Mary in the language of Nadia Weber without sentimentality or cynicism. For many, even today, Mary is a model of holy femininity. She is forever sinless, forever a virgin, and forever a mother. With a real Mary, please stand up. Well, I think she has. You see, I think that Luke's account of the visitation gives us a portrait of Mary that cuts through most of our assumptions and stereotypes. It is a nuanced portrait that balances fear with courage, doubt with faith, vulnerability with strength. And along the way, it gives to us a portrait of ourselves, of what we, the church, might become at our very best. I offer you, therefore, three gifts that I believe the visitation story offers to us on this fourth Sunday in Advent. First, this story of the visitation offers us the gift of community. As soon as Mary says yes to Gabriel's astonishing request, she goes in haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth. She doesn't isolate herself. She doesn't keep God's secret to herself. She doesn't attempt to go solo. She realizes she can't do it alone. And so she seeks out a fellow traveler a companion on the way, Elizabeth. It's easy to imagine why a young girl with a crazy sounding story like this one would make such an urgent journey. You all know that in Mary's culture, first century, her culture and her religion puts her at odds with all authority. Her pregnancy is an absolute scandal. At best, it renders her an object of scornful gossip and rejection. At worst, it places her at risk of death by stoning, according to the law. 
Needless to say, Mary needs safety, affirmation, empathy, companionship, a safe environment. She needs a sanctuary. She needs someone to recognize, nurture, and deepen the work of God in her life. She needs someone who will receive, not protect. Someone who will love, not judge. Someone who will nourish, not condemn. Is there a better job description for the church? I think not. A better job description for Redeemer? I can't think of one. What would it be like if we sought each other out with the trust and openness of Mary, her utter transparency with Elizabeth, her cousin? What would it be like if we, like Elizabeth, received with tenderness all of the marginalized, all of the vulnerable, all who come to us seeking refuge and nurture, support, and safety in a sacred space. What would that be like? Can we imagine? We have glimpses from time to time, and we celebrate when that happens. Mary and Elizabeth, the young girl and the old woman, the unmarried and the married, the socially established and the socially vulnerable, <coughs> finding common ground in their love for God. As Henry Allen describes it, God's most radical intervention into history was listened to and received in community. What a gorgeous, challenging example for all of us to live up to. The second gift, I think, is the gift of blessing. Can you imagine the hard questions in Mary's mind and heart as she travels to visit Elizabeth? So many possibilities, so many occasions for doubt rumbling around in her mind and Heart. We are told that she is, in fact, perplexed by Gabriel's announcement, but she says yes to the angel's request. Although Luke doesn't elaborate, we can all imagine the questions possibly roaming around the recesses of Mary's heart and mind. Questions like, is Joseph going to leave now? Will he ever marry me? Will my parents still love me? How will I survive the pain of childbirth? Who will help me when my time comes to deliver? Who will support and love this baby if I die in childbirth? How can I possibly raise the Son of God? Is any of this real? Is it just a cosmic joke? Is it a hoax? Or am I delusional? Into all of this, into all of this not known, comes an outpouring of blessing from Elizabeth. Blessed are you, woman, she tells Mary. Furthermore, she says, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then Elizabeth astutely connects the dots in Mary's story. It is Elizabeth who makes the connection between trust 
and blessing. You see, in Elizabeth's mind, Mary's favorite status has nothing to do with wealth, education, finances, health, comfort, or ease. Nothing to do with religion, and nothing to do with marital status. Her blessing lies solely in her willingness to trust God and to surrender to God's will, to lean hard into God's promises, to believe that they will sustain her no matter what. I wonder how desperately Mary needs this blessing by the time she lands on Elizabeth's doorstep, exhausted, scared, pregnant. How badly she needs someone to remind her that even after the angels leave, after the light fades, and after the vision receives, God's faithfulness remains. She needed a hug. She didn't need a lot of words. She needed to feel the affirmation that Elizabeth extended to her in the form of a blessing. And you know what? My guess is Mary carries Elizabeth's blessing in her heart for the rest of her life. And she will need it. After all, being the mother of Jesus is not easy. It leads her straight from scandal to danger to trauma to devastation. She delivers her baby in a stinky, smelly, nasty barn alongside farm animals, working animals. When she becomes a refugee, she flees to a foreign country, Egypt, to prevent her son's murder. What does that blessing feel like? When Jesus is all grown up and he is arrested, beaten, mocked, and executed like a common criminal, Elizabeth recognizes and affirms that Mary's faith is precious. Elizabeth names and blesses Mary's capacity for deep trust as a gift worth celebrating. What would it be like to recover Elizabeth's vocation of blessing? What would that be like for you and for our community? What would it be like to cultivate the spiritual gift of attentiveness, the gift of paying attention, to, let, to gaze long and to gaze deeply at each other, looking for glimpses of God. How would our parents change if we made a point of discerning, naming, and blessing the divine that we see in one another? And all of those who step on this holy ground, all of those who come into this holy space. We are told Elizabeth exclaims with a loud voice and a loud cry when she recognizes God's life-changing work in Mary. You know, I believe the takeaway here is simply this. Joy flourishes when we're willing to humbly bless each other. The third gift is the gift of hope. Once Mary receives both community 
and blessing, she finds her prophetic voice. Imagine this pregnant teenage girl. A voice so prophetic, words so prophetic, that for 2,000 years they have rained down, it seems, the very presence of God upon our lives. We're told that at the end of the gospel, Mary burst into song, not just any song, but a radical hope drenched song that soars the promise for the world's poor. A song that soars with promise for the world's brokenhearted, for the marginalized, for the oppressed, and I would like to think for every little girl who finds herself pregnant and on the doorsteps of a church or a house somewhere. My soul magnifies the Lord, Mary sings, and then her song goes on to do just that, to make more visible and more clear, to magnify for the world the love of God. She sings, the proud are scattered and the humble honored. The hungry are fed and the rich sent away. The powerful are brought down and the lowly are lifted up. Mary describes the world rendered, reordered, and renewed. A world so beautifully characterized by love and justice, only the Christ she carries in her womb, lodging there, and birth it into being. What does your Magnificat sound like? How is God magnified through your life? How is God magnified through our parish life together? What words have you found to express the radical, revolutionary hope of the Messiah you care? As we come to the end of this Advent season, may Mary's word encourage us to receive and to share the gifts of community, blessing, and hope. The Messiah is coming. So make haste. Be blessed. Magnify the Lord. Amen. Join me as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of all might, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God from the Father, God from God, life from life. True God, true God, be God not made, of one being of the Father. Through him all things are made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate through our virgin Mary, and from the same man. For our Father's sake, he was crucified as the Father's Father. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
celebrating birthdays, Joseph Conker, Henry Taylor, for those celebrating anniversaries, Bobby and Nancy Powell, Ellen Copeland and Jordan Mercados. Pray for our animal friends, General. We praise to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the communion of the church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints that they may have rest in that place where there is no pain, <coughs> but life eternal. We praise you, O Lord. Lord, Lord Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another in all our life to Christ our God. Amen. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us. And all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God. We confess that we have sinned against you in all prayer and duty. All that we have done, all that we have done to them, we cannot love you in our whole heart. We cannot love our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. We make the light of your will. Walk in your place to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
because that's quite frankly the kind of church we have. And uh, our size lends itself to doing things together with children, young people, and adults. There will be, finally, your children's sermon. There will not be a manuscript. And, uh, and I can tell you that the hardest sermon I preach is a children's sermon. But that will be on uh, Christmas Eve. So, 5 o'clock. And uh, I hope that all of you will be here. It gives you and allows you time to go home, to be with friends. And after you leave here and get settled in with your family and neighbors, you can get into the eggnog. <laughs> and invite me. <laughs> oh. After the new year, as long as we can stay healthy and move forward, the, the children's sermon will become a, a regular part of our worship experience. And uh, that's something that's always been uh, a, a mainline kind of uh, part of the liturgy for me. And so we'll be concluding our children in a more pointed and uh, experiential way on Sunday mornings. So we'll do that after the New Year. We'll, we'll get a glimpse of that on Christmas Eve. Uh, speaking of our young people, we have a new acolyte. And uh, Brooklyn is um, right there, and uh, she, has, she has been uh, looking forward to this, and so after church today, give her, give her a hug, give her a blessing, okay? And uh, thank you, Brooklyn, so much, so much. She and other children will be involved with us on Christmas Eve. So, uh, that is an invitation for you. Uh, to bring neighbors, to bring your grandchildren, and uh, to do those kinds of things. All of them. All of them. Isn't it wonderful to gather around this table? It's like the table in my house in the kitchen when I was growing up. You know, that's where we did our homework. That's where we had our meals. That's where we did <coughs> projects. That's where I made Halloween costumes, at the kitchen table. It was really the heart of our home. It's where the neighborhood boys and girls gathered for refreshment. There was no TV in that room, it was the table. And it was a gathering place. And so it is. Every Sunday, our good Lord invites us to gather around his table, no matter who you are. Regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, there is a place here for you at this table. And I delight in that. I hope you do as well.
thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power, in great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Thank you. 
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.